performed the uh, the papers for the uh, for the contribution uh, to be here uh, discussing in the session the problem of the uh, of the uh, COVID nineteen and economic policy for a sustainable recovery. Okay, and uh, the chairman is uh, Marcello Signorelli, Perugia University, uh, and uh, uh, the Economy Society, the Society of the Economy, Italian Economist. So, thank you, Marcello. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you to everybody for the participation and for the, I mean, the contribution that will are uh, 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 presenting to us. Okay, uh, Marcello, the share is, the thank floor you is to much. you. Thank you very much, Luigi, uh, for your work, for organizing this uh, 32nd edition of the Villa Mondragone International Economic Seminar and especially for continuing to collaborate with the Italian Economic Association that uh, since some years we started this uh, fruitful collaboration. But I think we can uh, start immediately because we have four very interesting and very rich papers and the discussion, so we don't have a lot of time. I fully agree. So Donato Masciandaro is presenting something very unusual. So the lesson of Venice 1630, for today's central banking and uh, the pandemic recession. So please Donato, and the, when Nicola will solve the problem, uh, we'll do a presentation. Please Donato. Okay. Thanks, uh, may I, uh, Mr. Chairman, may I ask just a, only a moment to say hello to Donato Masciandaro. It's a lot of time that I haven't the possibility to be in touch with him, but uh, I have the opportunity to address him. Anyway. Time the article on uh, the Sole Ventipatore on the other the newspaper. So, my, my best welcome, uh, Donato. Uh, my best welcome to everybody, obviously, uh, to Enrico Marelli, to Antella Saccone, uh, to Anna Maria Simonazzi, a Pompea della Costa, and especially at Nicola Accocella, that has been so kind to give me uh, 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 a mail for San Luigi. I'm... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Luigi, go ahead, Luigi go ahead. I'm so glad because as usual, you show that you are always the first mover because you anticipate my thanks to you and the pleasure <laughs> to, to see you again after a long time, a long time. So as usual, it's you know, as it's you are a sort of never-ending story. You are always the first mover. So, thanks for your invitation and glad to be here. Now I'm wondering with Marcello, what about my slides? What do I have to do? I have to share. Yes. I have to share with you and with the participants um, the screen. Sorry, let me just. Let me just open, open the slides that I need. These are the slides. Now I can, now I can, now I can share. Screen. Okay, this is a, um, do you see my yes. slides? It's okay. Okay, let me, uh, you know, in order, you know, for the sake, you know, in order to save time, um, let me just uh, recall the motivation. This is recession has been defined an unconventional one, for example, by Christine Lagarde. Why an unconventional? Because usually a conventional recession starts in one of the traditional three part of our macroeconomic system and then triggering uh, to a contagion effect the other sectors. In this case, we have an exceptional, uh, unconventional, I would say recession, because we have an outside trigger, which uh, has been the mix between the pandemic per se and the consequences and the related health policies made by the policymakers all around the world. 
and so we we, we can wonder uh, is this recession unique is a sort of outlier my answer is no because we can find out in history some interesting tales for example from the serenissima experiences and i'm just try to summarize today uh, a tale and there is a background paper made by Charles Goodhart, Stefano, Stefano Ugolini and myself. And this paper basically is, uh, is an historical monetary policy paper in a sense that we apply a, a modern monetary policy model uh, at, um, in trying to interpret a past uh, past history, and because we are convinced that this kind of exercise is a is is a two way uh, story, in the sense that we can learn more from we can understand better the past and and, and the present uh, as well, and the historical case is exactly a pandemic recession with occurring Venice. Uh, during the year uh, 1629 and 1639, when the Republic, the Serenissima, fought first a FMI and then a plague pandemic. Um, which is the bottom line of the paper is that so the monetary policy that the Republic implemented during uh, these years can be considered an historical case of helicopter money. Um, let me give uh, some really, notwithstanding the time constraints, some background information on Venice. Venice impl implemented its first legislation to address a plague in 1423, and a health office was established in 1490. So they were able to react when, when a pandemic um, occurred. So they developed uh, regulation on plague with essentially three aims to prevent is originating in Venice, to impede its importation, and to check its spread should this break down in the city. And during the plague episodes, the Serenissima imposed a general blockade on all neighbors suspected of pain. On top, the containment measure would carry into effect on a colossal scale with full resource of the state. And in this occasion, the trade-off that today we know really well between health and economics eventually emerged. Emerged and with it the political and economic cost and benefit analysis. Uh, let let me say that you know for me it was really exciting to study these past experiences because I find out really anecdotal uh, quite similar to the today um, story. For example, uh, let me quote an episode in 1579 when the Senate reacted in a very slow way both for political reasons, both denying the plague and downsizing the number of and nature of this. And if you wonder why, the answer is that politics matter. Uh, let me quote a textile merchant that complained for the quarantine, given that an incomparable greed number of people has died purely as a result of unemployment than all tables of any other contagious diseases. In this kind of a session, also the population was watchful of the activities of the politician, and they were ready to riot and tumult if they became convinced that the government was not doing all it could and should have done to ensure the availability of food, guaranteeing the so-called right of breath. So how the Senate of the Serenissima usually address and fix this trade-off between health and economics. The answer was eventually fiscal bazooka. Uh, let me use modern terminology, which is the idea. The idea is that usually during the pandemics, the Senate bought necessary goods from merchants. And city districts were put in quarantine 
The inhabitants were provided by the states for laws were promoted to reduce the risk of disease. Moreover, Venetian politician influences employment and nominal wages in sectors under its total or partial control as the arsenal. Finally, last but not least, during the pandemic, a program of public work were likely to be defined and implemented in order to give unemployment people a livelihood was considered. At the end of the story, in all of, the, all, all of these episodes, we have a crucial chain with four rings. The first rings are pandemic cost for the inhabitants. The second ring are the reaction of the government, i.e. fiscal transfer with its financing problem. And finally, there is a dimension in terms of political consensus. Let me just give you uh, four uh, pictures of these four uh, essential rings of our chain. First, first ring pandemic cost in the past and in the, in the present, when a pandemic occurs, economic activity can be hit in different ways. How to capture these differences, how to capture the fact that citizens can be hit in an heterogeneous way. A simple way is to distinguish between risky activity and safe activity, where the risky activity are the activities that are hit by the pandemic, means by the pandemic per se and by the, by the containment policies. Why safe activity are, 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 are safe with respect to this risk. So in a way, um, using the usual micro foundation of a micro model, we can define the budget constraints of, of a citizens as the sum up of these two uh, possible source of revenue. Given this pandemic cost, the government, I will say is forced to intervene, to inject resources in the economy, and uh, which could be a general metric for this fiscal action, could be a proportion of the citizen loss. Moreover, the government have to finance this fiscal bazooka, and the three levers are the usual one, uh, taxes, debts, and uh, monetization. Um, which is the which is the objective function of the government. Um, let me start from the usual assumption that the government is a benevolent policymaker, i.e., is a social planner. So, which could be the key part of um, her or his objective function? Essentially, three: the direct channels consumption effect, on top, we can have two kinds of externality. Monetary instability costs, the more we, we do fiscal monetization on one side. On the other side, more pandemic policy gains, i.e. the gains to implement a public policy action, i.e. without this policy, we will have higher cost, second round effects. In the overall designs of this policy, there is also monetization and the social planner can design an optimal monetization. It is easy to show that this money optimal fiscal monetization will depends on how the taxes are distorsive, how the cost of them is high and how higher are the monetary externality sensibility among the cities. Final step, are we sure that the government is a social planner? The answer is no. So what about if we assume that first in charge, we have not a benevolent dictators, but a politician and two, 
the citizens are heated in an heterogeneous way by the fiscal transfer action and by its finances as well. At the end of the story, the more are through these this two assumptions, the more it's possible that each citizens have preferences respect to the overall economic policy and re regarding the, monetiz the monetization, which can be different from the social optima one. And it is possible to define in general, it's a multiple equilibrium sector. In other way, here, the nutshell, which is the bottom line. The bottom line is that technically we can define any kind of monetization. There is no problem to define technically a fiscal monetization. The real problem for the implementation is the political consensus around this monetization. Okay, if this is the theoretical framework, there was, which was the historical episode. There was a bubonic plague that hit Venice from September 1630 to September 1631. And on top, we have to remember that in early modern times, we have usually the three horses of apocalypse. In general, we have war, famine, and epidemics that were. Um, deeply intertwined. In fact, in 1629, the republics has already coped with the famine, where extreme hunger has been the one hand correlated with war and the other hand with the blow. There was a massive heartbreak in, in uh, Venice that was really huge in absolute terms as also comparing hit with uh, modern Fiji. There was a series of consequences of the inhabitants, a series of consequences, both from a demographic point of view and from an economic point of view. We have no time to speculate on this, but in order to, to address these pandemics, as you know, the, the Senate decide immediately to have the population with a fiscal bazooka. How to finance it? Uh, here I have just to recall that Venice in early modern time reached a degree of monetization completely unknown for century anywhere has. In fact, in order to economize on coins, inhabitants, citizens commonly use check and bank transfers, even for the lower middle class. Republic of the Mice issues both commodity money, cons, and convertible monies as well through the establishment of two subsequent and overlapping public banks, the Rialto Bank and the Giro Bank. The setting, the overall setting in modern, using modern terminology, was a fiscal dominance regime in the sense that the Senate uh, in economically, the Senate control completely both the fiscal level and, and the monetary level. So what the Senate did on the one side, he established a lump sum wealth tax. On the other side, he implement a monetary helicopter money. In other way, what was the decision in terms of monetary policy? In normal time, we have the zero bank that issues roughly 800,000 of dukes. Then during the pandemic, the zero balance sheet reached a peak of over more than, more than 2.6 um, uh, million dukes in June 6030. 6030. In other way, we enter definitely in extraordinary time. Which was the consequences? The consequences was a huge depreciation of the money and the collapse of the zero bank. But the government at the end of the story was able to come back to new normal at the end of the story. 
later on, but it was able to come back. Why the story uh, can be just defined, not just an exceptional monetary policy action, but specifically an helicopter money. Here we have the definition of helicopter money uh, um, proposed by Galli in 2020. And, and this modern definition is, is, is the last one of a long uh, history of definition. And let me just note in here, or if there is an, any clique, which is Love Us Me, history of economic thought, it seems to me that the Friedman 1969 image of helicopter money sound quite similar to, to, the, uh, to the image that Hume uh, used in uh, 1752. But let me close this history of economic thought um, consideration and which is, which is in a nutshell this, this definition. We have helicopter money, one, two, assumption occurred. On one side, we have an extraordinary monetary policy expansionary action. But in parallel, we have in modern time intended losses in the central bank balance sheets. Uh, in Venice, we have these two assumption that holds uh, with the specification that the losses, we have no documents, but we, we cannot say we, if the losses were tender or unintended, but uh, the Senate Venice decision absolutely were absolutely consistent with the modern definition of helicopter money. Here we have just a picture to give you a visual sense of what happened in terms of UCAD evaluation during bloke uh, just to just to you know to be compliant with the time constraints which are the takeaway of the story I, I'm, uh, um, let me specify that this is normal uh, this is a positive analysis it's not a normative analysis so from a positive a point of view, I think that we can have at least three different takeaway. First, the relationships between history and economics is really a two-way road. On the one side, as I said in my at the beginning of my of my uh, reflection, historical events are usable for evaluated current macroeconomic situation. On top, modern economic theory can provide a logical framework to analyze historical facts. Secondly, uh, the event that today we, we, we could are exceptional, uh, true, uh, are likely to be unconventional, but are, com are not completely unknown. In fact, first, we already noted this link between pandemic recession and heterogeneous consequences on citizens, i.e. inequality matters. Secondly, we already found out the trade-off between policies on one side and economic uh, reasons and consideration on the others. Third, in terms of economic policies, we found out in historical past this mix between the need of fiscal containment policies and the need to finance is through money creation. Last but not least, I think that the big takeaways in, in, this, in this tale is that uh, there is a never ending story. The ever ending story is that any uh, monetary policy action can be completely analyzed if you use at least two, methodolog two methodological tools, economics on one side and political economy on the other side. In other way, and to be focused on helicopter money, 
if you if you, if you're thinking about that, Friedman proposed these metaphors in 1969, and so far I never see a monetary uh, an helicopter money that fly, which could be the interpretation. My interpretation is that from a technical point of view, there could be no problem to have an helicopter money. But the helicopter money is um, less likely to occur. It's difficult to be implemented for political economy reason, because the more you have a monetary policy that trigger heterogeneous distributional effect on, on the citizen, the more, um, the more difficult it will be to reach a consensus. Let me stop here. With this Thank you, fantastic. Donato. Thank you very much. Now, the discussant uh, in very few minutes, uh, Pompeo della Posta, University of Pisa. Thank you very much. I'm struggling with my video. It might go away, but anyway, I'm going to share the screen because I have a few slides to accompany my discussion. So, first of all, uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Donato, for the nice presentation. Okay. I think you should be seeing my screen now. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, okay, so um, this, uh, this is just the introductory part. Uh, well, I'm afraid I, I, I relied very much on the, on the CPR discussion paper that was circulated at the beginning. So I read that one and I took that as a reference. There, there are many similarities, of course, with the presentation that Donato gave us today, but also some differences. So, uh, you know, in, in the discussion paper, in, in the original uh, paper that uh, he you know, was circulating, he distinguished between net worth helicopter money and monetary base helicopter money. Right? And these are two different uh, concepts that I think uh, can, be, um, can be seen more clearly by looking at, the, uh, at, at this, uh, uh, this little simple uh, approach, right? which, is, uh, which is the accounting approach of the central bank. So uh, if we start, you know, central bank has gold, assets, and liabilities, right? And the, just for the, the accounting uh, rules, uh, gold, the, the side, the asset side, has to correspond to the liability side, right? So you have this net capital. This is very important. We'll come back. The fact that here to what we have in the asset, what happens here is the net capital, okay? So what happens when you create monetary base? And, and he also discusses the issue of senior age because the two different... Uh, definitions of, uh, of uh, helicopter money imply also have different implications for senior age. So in the case in which uh, you know, there is no senior age, uh, gold is simply transformed into monetary base. This is a gold standard, typical gold standard with, with no, in fact, with no senior age. Why? Because gold uh, applies directly to monetary base. But you can also have senior age. What does it mean, senior age? It means that you have gold, but then you have uh, a nominal, uh, you know, nominal value on the coins that you that you that you print, uh, and the nominal money is higher than than the actual content in gold, right? And so this means that you get a, a, a little difference, which is the amount of senior. This you can think of, of this as the credit that goes to the treasury, right? So uh, once you uh, you do. Um, you, 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 we, go, we, mo we move to the definitions that, uh, that um, uh, Donato gives us and his authors give us about helicopter money. This is the first definition, net worth helicopters money. The, the, uh, the definition that implies, and this is the you know, a conclusion that recurs in the literature quite often, is that whenever you uh, produce this, uh, this supply of money, you lose capital. Why? Because you see that the net capital used to be 10 and now it becomes eight in this little example, right? Um, why? Because, uh, because you create this, these two units of, uh, of money uh, that goes to uh, finance you know, uh, uh, citizens. This is also the, the crucial point in this definition of helicopter money, here you really do not have government expenditure, right? So you don't have anything here on the asset side, right? You just throw money to the citizens with no, nothing in exchange for the, for the central bank. So there is nothing here on the asset side. And this is why you have this uh, loss here. 
However, it should be clear that this is a virtual loss. It's not a, a, a proper loss, right? So you have thrown money, you have created money, you have in, in, in uh, theoretical terms lost some capital, although it, you know, my claim is that it's not a proper loss. This instead is the other uh, definition of, uh, of uh, uh, helicopter money. The monetary, what he defines and he supposed to define monetary based helicopter money. Here there is a government intervening, right? So if we go back to Friedman, of course, in the Friedman case, he doesn't believe in the government. So he, he prefers to throw money directly to the citizens. Whereas in the other case, money is thrown to the government that then makes the fiscal expenditure for the citizen, right? So, but in this case, as you can see, there is uh, uh, something here on the asset side, government assets. So there is a creation of money, but there is a counterparty here on the asset side. So there is no loss of, of capital, right? So this is uh, a little clarif clarification. And this is very important for the, for the conclusions that, uh, that um, and the main, 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 I would say, critical point that I'm going to raise to, to the, uh, again, to the working paper rather to, to, to the, than to the pre today's presentation. Um, another point which, uh, uh, and so we'll, we'll get back to that uh, in, in, a, in a minute. Another point that which is raised in the uh, working paper that I, I read is relative to the role of inequality. They claim that inequality matters. And in particular, they write, they, they, they say, consolidating the balance sheet of the sheets of the mint and of the giro bank the mint is uh, you know what the government can do to print money so there is a strange definition of government which of course corresponds to the historical case uh, government could print money could coin yeah could, could, could uh, print coins and the giro bank giro bank which is sort of commercial bank that was uh, uh, um, uh, issuing inside money right so consolidated balance sheets of mint and Giro bank and having heterogeneous citizens, therefore inequality matters, we show that the Republic actually implemented helicopter money driven by political economy reasons in order to avoid popular riots. So basically they claim that this uh, issuing of helicopter money, whatever the form it was in the Venice Republic, uh, was due to the, this problem of inequality. Now, if we look at the literature on inequality, we see that uh, there, there is quite some skepticism on the, on the effects of inequality on riots, revolutions, et cetera, et cetera, right? So in fact here, what I would claim is that rather than issue of inequality here, what matters is really the extreme poverty, the fact that these people were just starving. And so this is why you have riots, not because you have inequality, they feel that they have less than the others, but they are surviving, they are just not surviving. So maybe pointing to the role of inequality might be, I don't know, barking at the, uh, at the, wrong, uh, the wrong tree, I don't know. Um, but, you know, I, I go to the final point, Marcello, I see, I see you, you're getting nervous. The main objection. What is the main objection? Well, because you say, because the Giro Bank was a state bank with no paid up capital, the operation actually amounted to ba a bailout of the central bank by the government, right? So uh, here, first of all, you have uh, the, the sort of fancy, apparently fancy point that the government bails out the central bank rather than the other way around. We are usually, uh, we, we usually think about the, you know, the central bank bailing out the governments and not the way around. So they argue that what the Venetian Republic did implied losses for the money, money issuer. So the government intervened. They had to, uh, you know, to activate the mint to print coins to repay the excess of, of inside money printed by the uh, Giro Bank. And this, in, in their interpretation, implied the fact that uh, they incurred a loss because this, uh, um, uh, this uh, money printed by the government had, will, will have to be repaid by taxes. So this is why the, the losses. And they say, this is exactly the same loss that we experience with the modern form of helicopter money, right? But my claim is that this, again, this parallel is not really appropriate because in the net worth helicopter money, the losses of the central bank are only nominal, as we have discussed before, only nominal and virtual. They are an accounting element. What the authors, what authors want to suggest is that they are proper, true loss, implying the imposition of future, future taxes. But this is precisely what uh, you know, the helicopter money is for. 
you know, if we ask the central bank, the European Central Bank, to pay for the expenses to, you know, to, to respond to the pandemic, it's precisely because we don't want to have the burden of the debt to repay in three, four, five years' time, right? A burden that might uh, actually kill, might, might risk to kill our, our uh, recovery. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see that Marcello Thanks. is... <laughs> Thanks, Pompeo. Uh, Donato, you have to select uh, one point uh, raised uh, by Pompeo, so one minute for a reply. Oh, um, Marcello, I'm glad because what one finger means one second, no, one, one minute. Uh, Pompeo, uh, thanks a lot for, for your discussion. Um, I'm sure that with more time we can, we, we, we can agree because uh, having a working paper and a short presentation, I'm sure that, you know, the sender is obscured and, and so, so the delivering can be, can be uh, better. But, but in, in a nutshell, I'm, 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 I'm uh, we are, we are convinced that if we consider that in extraordinary time, for example, in Venice was the government that bailed out the central bank, which was not a commercial bank. Absolutely no. What the state issued public banks with no commercial business. So uh, definitely it was a central bank. Oops, I cannot say central bank because there is a debate between Charles Gooder on, on the one side and others. Because Charles said in Venice there were no private banks. So we cannot say a central bank. So let, let me stop here on this terminology this discussion, but Pompeo, um, I remain to be convinced that, uh, you know, in extraordinary time, if there is bailout, there is a big differences between an um, a helicopter mine just with monetary base and helicopter mining with capital losses. It's, um, it's imply a different flow different destination of the future flow of seniors. But let me stop here, I became boring, and thank you, Pompeo, for your discussion. Thank you, we try again with the Nicola, thank you, Donato. Nicola Cocella, if uh, now the, the computer is working. Uh, you can try to uh, unmute your microphone. If, uh, if, uh, No, it's still not working. So no, 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 it works. But Nicola, try. It's low, but it's working. I cannot hear. Sorry. You, you have to, to check again the computer to increase the volume of the microphone. So we move to the, the other presentation. So uh, Anna Simonazzi, uh, Sapienza University of Rome and the National Council of Economics and Labor. Um, she will talk about the Germans two models and the long-term sustainability of Eurozone. Please, Anna. Thank you very much. I try to share my, my presentation. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, fine. Uh, I will try to be, uh, let me try to see, yes, I will try to be uh, brief. Uh, let me start with the motivation. Uh, the EU faces a future, uh, the title is of course, uh, sorry, Germany's two models uh, and the long-term sustainability of the Eurozone. The motivation is that the EU faces a future of high public and private debts at a time when the world economy is undergoing a structural change of proportions comparable to that experienced in the 70s. These challenges pose a serious threat to the entire European Union and in particular to its weaker members, calling for a new, more cohesive industrial policy, including a massive investment program that is at odds with premature fiscal tightening and the return to the old rules. In uh, my presentation, I investigate the economic and political conditions for this change to come about, arguing that it would require nothing short of a U-turn in economic theory and policies. The macroeconomic uh, and the, the macroeconomic and 
at the industrial level. I pay particular attention to Germany as it is decisive in defining the European response to these multiple challenges. Uh, I skip the outline and uh, let me start with the question that also uh, Nicola Cocella will take on in his presentation, that is, is the COVID-19 a game changer? Uh, I, will, I can go pretty quickly on comparing the two crises, the, 19, the 2008 crisis and the, the current one. In the aftermath of the 2008 crisis, it was believed that with the evidence of the costs caused by neoliberalism and financialization, Keynesian thinking would finally be reasserted. But after a brief Keynesian spell, austerity came instead, ushered in by the bailout of the financial system and the doom loop between banks and the, the states. Recurring crises within the Eurozone and the changing international conditions exposed the vulnerability of the Eurozone economic model and the inadequacy of its institutional structure. So even before the, the current pandemic, there was a growing awareness of the gravity of these challenges and that urged a rethinking of policies and institutions. But proposals of reforms met with creditor countries outright opposition or only partial implementation. The banking union is the most eclatant example. However, compared to the post-2008 crisis, the response to the pandemic has been much faster. The European Central Bank intervention has been swift, large, and most important, targeted to more fragile countries. On the fiscal front, we have the stability pact that was suspended and state aid regulations temporarily relaxed. National governments undertook huge increases in public debt to subsidize firms, workers, and households. Then came the next generation EU, which was ushered in by the Franco-German agreement and hailed as an Hamiltonian moment. Despite surging fiscal deficit, even high country, high debt countries enjoyed extremely low interest rates. So the first question is, is this a Keynesian moment? So that is, does this remarkable monetary and fiscal activism mean a rehabilitation of Keynesian theory? Well, there are several hints that we can see, let's say the supremacy is still attributed to savings as a permissive condition for investment. The claim that complementarities between monetary and fiscal policies should be fully exploited in tail events, but may be irrelevant or even counterproductive in normal times and cannot be made to be permanent. The frequent reference to the need to return as soon as possible to rules of sound finance the undisputed priority given to the problem of public debt to such an extent to, to suggest uh, allocating part of the next generation EU uh, to debt reduction. And finally, the influential minority in the European Central Bank's Governing Council, recently joined by Weidmann, favoring an earlier end to monetary easing. All these examples uh, provide ample evidence suggesting that we are still within the textbook uh, Keynesian case of depression. Once we are out of the tail event, the old rule, rules apply again. So the post-pandemic path will be mainly defined in terms of, or is mainly defined in terms of how to pay, how to pay off the debt. And we have different uh, opposite positions. There is uh, the German and the Northern countries position, which says that the Stability and growth path should stay. We need fiscal consolidation, that means rein in the deficit and reduce the public debt, which has been inherited by the pandemic. Not only Schäuble, but even recently Schultz said that the stability and growth path should stay. And then there is the other uh, position uh, held mainly by the French uh, academics, which says, revisions and rein or reinterpretations of rules, which means get rid of numbers. There is no analytical basis for uh, these numbers and go for country specific medium terms objectives. Well, one should know that this would not 
lighten that burden of uh, the most indebted countries and puts too much or uh, a task on income growth in reducing the debt to GDP ratio. Uh, there is a growing co consensus that uh, argues that debt criteria are too far from the post-COVID realities. A return to the rules of the pre-crisis era would be fatal for the survival of the euro. So these, there are several pro uh, proposals for mutualization, monetization. The discussion is open, but the creditor countries are not uh, very convinced. I would like to argue that uh, even a change of fiscal rules without a change of the whole model is unlikely to bring about the much needed convergence between core and periphery. What is needed is addressing the long-term structural problems that led to the increasing divergences among its members across all, along all the uh, period of Europeanization, the process to uh, increase uh, the convergence. The structural causes of divergence can be explained in terms of the divergent trajectories of interdependent economies with different productive capabilities. There is no time to enter in this analysis. We have wrote a, a, a book on this uh, together with uh, Chely, Warasho, and Ginsburg. But uh, this is a most important point because uh, it uh, depends on whether we are responding to these causes, whether in the future we have, will have convergence or divergence. And uh, the idea is that the southern peripheral countries were exposed to macroeconomic and industrial policy measures that, although apparently neutral, generated different effects and increasing regional disparities between core and periphery and within countries. This is a very important point because we talk about symmetric and asymmetric shocks, but symmetric shocks, as the recent pandemic shows, can have very asymmetric consequences. That is, the same policy has not the same effects on countries that are on different levels of development. And this is what uh, this uh, slide would like to show. We had two shocks in the 2000s. China access to the World Trade Organization and eastward enlargement. And these two shocks, let's call them, had very different effects. China access meant a new market for Germany, but a new competitor for the South and European countries. Eastward enlargement similarly meant the redirection of German foreign direct investment and trade to the eastern countries, somehow displacing the south, southern uh, economies. So we, we end up with uh, two peripheries, the south and the eastern periphery, suffering from different fragilities, which descend from their common, albeit diverse, economic and financial dependence on the core. But the core itself is dependent on the pattern of specialization within the European Union. The South provides an outlet for its surplus of manufacturers. The Eastern countries supply cheap inputs for its industries. So this combination of structural divergence and economic interdependence lies behind the fragility of the Union, but also on the improbability of its disintegration, given the high costs that it would entail for core and peripheries alike. Uh, it is always said that uh, it will never be the same again. In fact, as in the 70s, the EU is confronting with new epochal changes in the world of production, the digital transformation, new consumption patterns, reversal from globalization to regional blocks, as well as growing inequalities and disenchantment with the European project. COVID-19 has speeded up the path of these changes. Germany and the entire Europe are falling behind in the technical in, tech, in the tech race and must compete in a global market with nations that are actively supporting their industry in the innovation race. This 
calls for a common coordinated response for a radical change in the institutional and productive structures of the Eurozone. And so we need a new industrial strategy for Europe. And this has been finally launched by the European Commission to cope with the twin transition to green and digital. But these changes risk to worsen the gap between core and periphery. New technologies are based on system integration that operate at both the technological and the organizational levels. Their opportunities are maximized when they interact with a closely connected technological advanced network, which is often missing in late comer countries. Moreover, big tech companies have created a closed oligopolistic market. The omnipresent presence of digital technologies in industry and services offer these companies enormous power of penetration, control over the rest of the economy. So the traditional industrial policy based on granting subsidies, tax breaks, or credit facilities, which are the core of the uh, current uh, recovery fund of Italy, is no longer up to the task. The EU needs to balance two potentially conflicting objectives. On the one hand, foster EU scientific ex excellence and technological capabilities, and on the other, favoring convergence across its regions. The first objective requires to fill the EU's innovation gap, uh, uh, that is, to fill the EU's innovation gap will require an enormous effort in investment by member states and the EU. But convergence, preventing the digital transformation from becoming an additional factor of polarization, would call for massive investment in the weakest areas, aiming at strengthening infrastructure facilities, industrial capabilities, and technological transfer. And also, which is important, participation of firms from less developed regions to the European-wide programs, such as industrial alliances in batteries, semiconductors, and all that. So we need a new, more cohesive industrial policy. And this can only succeed if we have a U-turn in macroeconomic philosophy, including fiscal rules. If we need investment, we need to try a different solution to the fiscal uh, constraints. Here, Germany's stance is decisive, decisive. Uh, in the, the, the European well, response to these multiple challenges. And here we come to Germany. Uh, not even Germany can go alone in this international context, huh? but it can go on either together with the other member countries, giving a helping hand in the development of the whole European area, which means also the macroeconomic constraints, or as the leader of an economic empire. Past experience has demonstrated the short-sightedness of the latter option. Hmm? So the outcome of these two conflicting positions is uncertain. The German model is not monolithic, but rather a complex and changing process of antagonism and accommodation between different domestic advocacy co coalitions that sway German choices in European oh. and foreign policy. And uh, it exhibits over time subtle shifts in its center of gravity, depending on the particular situation and on which coalition is ascendant on particular issues. This makes the next election so important. However, fiscal hawks have to contend with the risks of implosion their policies could bring. And then remember the industrial interconnection between the East and the South. This is a problem if the European Eurozone blows up. Hmm? So this is my last point. Uh, and uh, it uh, uh, asks the question whether this time will be different. So the historically low German and European private and public expenditure has been a drag rather than a cause of greater prosperity. Savings without investment are not a, a brilliant idea. And uh, this has failed to drive in the direction of the urgently required modernization of physical, digital, and social infrastructure. Catching up with foreign incumbents 
and governing the technological transformation require an enormous effort in research and investment. This, in turn, requires replacing the doctrine of austerity with a growth-friendly model. And member countries must join forces to acquire minimal mass to compete with big tech incumbents. In the past, the prospect of the system imploding succeeded in mobilizing counteractive forces strong enough to stall disintegration. The next generation EU plan, plan can present the first step in the direction of more cohesive management of the EU. It requires swift and non-acrimonious consensus over the funds by the creditor countries and efficient use by the receiving countries. Whether it will be different this time, we'll see. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Very rich presentation and also very rich paper. I have uh, the discussion, so for me, the, the work is very simple because uh, I have not uh, strong critics on the details that you mentioned in your presentation and uh, more, uh, more uh, deeply in your paper, but I have uh, three comments. Uh, the first two uh, refer not uh, to economics, but more to politics and political economy, but more politics. The first one is, uh, I, I, I agree, obviously, that the German is crucial for, the, for the, the future of European Union, especially the European Monetary Union. But Germany, as we know all, is related to Merkel for several years. And you mentioned the, the next election. But what do you think about the possible role of Mario Draghi, the current Italian prime minister, eventually uh, our future uh, president of the Italian Republic on this uh, scenario from the political point of view, not uh, like uh, economist. I, I, I was asking you uh, about Mario Draghi as politician, because in my view, <laughs> he's, uh, the, he's a politician on, on several aspects. So do you think uh, it will be important, not only for Italian, but also for uh, Germany to move to the right model, to the better model? And this is the first point. The second uh, question is uh, about the awareness of Germany in the global scenario. Because uh, Germany now is as uh, uh, GDP, uh, with respect to global GDP, is uh, near 3%. Um, using a purchasing power parity uh, indicator. Um, it, it was six, near 6% uh, at the time of reunification. And in the same time, China moved from near 4% to the current 20%. So Germany is declining. Similarly, Europe, and also Eurozone, and Italy more in the global perspective. So what do you think about this global perspective, not only in terms of economic power, but also in terms of political and cultural power? The, the rise of China can play a role in convincing Germany to move in the right model, or according to your view, is not so important. And finally, a more specific um, question, point, on your presentation and more generally the, the topic that you arise. You mentioned that, uh, and I fully agree, the high costs of uh, disgregation of the Eurozone, um, but maybe also some benefits uh, and also costs, but also benefits for Germany to stay in the Eurozone are only partly investigated. I mentioned the, uh, not only the well-known uh, surplus in the current account of Germany, but also the role played by the dynamic of real exchange rate that is obviously related also to the surplus of the uh, current account. Uh, what do you think about this point? Economists and also politicians in the in European countries investigated enough this benefit for the uh, German economy or uh, need something more also to move again 
on the right direction, the, the German country that's, that I agree with you is crucial and for the future of the European Monetary Union, but I think also for a future role of Germany in the global context. How many hours do you give me? <laughs> Two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> First, Draghi. Well, I think he is well aware of uh, the constraints that Italy and the southern countries uh, meet with the public debt. Whether he will be as efficient as uh, in uh, his new role in the, in the Eurozone at large or not, I'm not sure. I think he was pretty uh, powerful when uh, he was uh, uh, governor of the European Central Bank. Now, as Prime Minister of Italy, he can play on his, uh, uh, let's say, uh, role or on his uh, on the trust that other uh, countries have in him. But uh, I mean, it's it depends very much on how the Italian economy is uh, developing the, in these first uh, years. And this, of course, depends not only on Italy but uh, as the inter interdependence between countries is so important, it depends also on what the other countries and Germany and France are doing. So I think he will have a tough job. Uh, is Germany aware of uh, the new uh, changing scenario in the international uh, context? Yes, I think it is aware. And it has got more aware in the recent times. They are planning huge investments. Let's take the automotive industry. Until before the pandemic, they didn't uh, give a, a, a hint to the electric uh, movement. Now they are investing hugely in these sectors. They are aware that they are behind in the digital technology and all that. As for China, here again, we have uh, the two, uh, the two, um, let's say, parties uh, towards China. They still think that China is very important as a market, so they they don't like very much to cut their ties with China. Uh, although they are aware that in this new international scenario, they cannot go alone. So they try to keep the European Union together to give not only economic, but also political force, strength, but uh, they are still following their uh, export led model. And uh, for that, they don't, they keep an eye very close to China. Uh, as for the costs of having Germany within the European uh, monetary union, or let's say the benefits that Germany is uh, having in terms of market, the export uh, surplus, in terms of depreciation of the euro or the Deutsche Mark that they would have. Uh, yes, I think that, uh, I mean, I think that we can demonstrate uh, uh, with figures and models these facts, but you cannot convince Germany of the benefits that they have. I mean, yeah, they know that, but they would say, why don't you do like, like us? No, nobody prevents you to export, become competitive and all that. So unless uh, you try to also work out the fact as we have tried, I think, to show that uh, a common area between different countries with the same rules doesn't lead to convergence. And even then, you can, I don't think you can convince that. <laughs> but we can try. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, let's try uh, again with uh, Nicola Acocella. If uh, now with the iPad, uh, maybe the, the situation is better. If not, uh, at the moment, maybe not. So we move to... Is it working? Okay, Nicola. Okay. <sighs> now my my slides my the, the problem is with my slides i the, don't have the problem because the, the technician can share the slide but if possible you, you have yes your video um yeah, okay now 
uh, okay, the problem is uh, that someone can work with my my slides. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. That's that's okay. Fine. Um, so. Okay. Okay. So the now the next one. Next one. Next one. Ah, uh, okay. That's a summary of the, of, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> the summary of my contribution. Um, uh, first two, the first two slides um, uh, deal with, uh, with uh, some premises. One is uh, uh, about economic policy as a discipline, and the other is, uh, is about the institutional, uh, the, the EU and EMU institutions um, and uh, then um, I will derive the consequences of these institutions in the third slides and the following um, uh, to deal uh, with the, and then deal with the, pan the, the impact of the pandemic and the, the novelties introduced by, um, uh, by this uh, uh, pandemic um, in the into the the, the uh, EU institutions. Um, finally, to ask whether is this is a provisional or a, a durable change of attitude. Next slide. Oh, so the uh, first. Um, oh, oh, thing to, to recall is that economic policy is a discipline <coughs> based on two pillars, social choice theory, um, <coughs> trying to, <coughs> to deal with the, the way uh, to pass from uh, 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 <coughs> to solve references. The second is to do with policy, um, whether it is possible to manage the economy uh, by the forces uh, were dismantling uh, just at the beginning of the, the 90s. Uh, an arrow and the uh, pillar in, uh, in uh, the seventies. Then there was a revolution by Matthias and the first pillar, and uh, I saw myself at the debate in, in uh, the process. Uh, uh, Am I the only one who cannot really properly hear? Uh, we cannot hear it perfectly. At the beginning it was okay, Nicola, but now it's not uh, really perfect. Can't you hear? Well, uh, okay, I hope that my points are clear. Now it's possible to from individual preferences to social preferences. And at the same time, uh, the government to manage with no problems, not only in the short term, contrary to what we can say, but in the middle and long run, uh, contrary to what we See. Next slide. Now, the institutional design and policies of um, the European institutions, um, these were are sim very simple institutions. Uh, as, to, as far as the monetary union is concerned, there is practically only um, an active policy, a common currency, but no fiscal union, uh, and limits fit set set for each country's 
uh, fiscal policy, which was first established by the stability and growth tax, and then at the beginning of the 2010s uh, by the fiscal compact. Practically, um, there are no rules. There were no rules for limiting current account imbalances. There were set uh, different current account imbalances for um, uh, for surpluses and uh, deficits, but uh, even uh, these were not. Um, uh, I'm sorry, there the limits for surpluses were not obeyed too. Then um, uh, for facing uh, current account expenses, uh, uh, there is a very low uh, budget, common budget, uh, which until to 2021 was only 1% one, 1 of the EU uh, GDP. Uh, so, um, the design of e, uh, EMU institutions was very simple, very, very simple until uh, 2021. Next slide, please. Next slide. No. Oh, uh, what um, what were the uh, inspiration of uh, of uh, these uh, uh, institutions? The liberal attitude prevailing in the world at the time of the draft of the the EMU, which was uh, about uh, the the end of the the eighties and um, early nineties. Uh, in addition, uh, the German ordo liberalism uh, was important um, to, for this design. Um, and uh, um, this idea uh, were to a large extent uh, imaged in, in the uh, EMU institutions. Next slide, please. What was the, the consequence, or really, what, what were the consequences? Um, a number of imbalances piled up um, before the financial crisis. On the one side, there were peripheral countries, prevailing southern uh, ones. Uh, on the other, core countries, central and northern uh, European countries. Um, this derived from uh, the fact that um, oh, the EMU institutions didn't tackle uh, the, the pre-existing pre asymmetries, in particular uh, the different uh, inflation rates or in the two group, groups of countries. Um, this caused speculation and bubbles in the peripheral countries. Oh, the EMU institutions uh, had an attitude of benign neglect. Um, and uh, these current, and there were current account imbalances, uh, deficits in the peripheral uh, zones, which were made, matched by capital movements. And uh, these capital movements, um, made um, equalized current account imbalances and um, uh, all seems seemed to work well until the financial crisis. When the financial crisis uh, erupted, uh, there was a capital movement reversal uh, to the, the core country. Uh, that reinf reinforces the crisis. Uh, the um, peripheral countries really were in a, in, a, in a bad situation. Next slide, please. Now, the impact of the pandemic and the provisions to face it. 
the pandemic has re revived the, um, uh, the financial crisis. Uh, but this time, um, there have been um, uh, relevant interventions by the EU um, uh, institutions. In particular, these were uh, manifold, really, uh, not only monetary and uh, um, of a similar kind, but uh, in particular, the next generation EU, the creation of this ge next generation EU fund, uh, which was very different from the previous one, uh, because not only introduced some kind of fiscalization of, uh, of expenses by the different uh, uh, countries, um, uh, which were charged to, to the, the EU budget, um, yeah, that raised uh, in, a, in a consistent way from uh, 1%, as I said before, uh, to about 2% of the European GDP, but um, uh, also because some common um, loans, uh, debt, uh, debt, debt by the um, issued by the European uh, Union um, were created. Uh, this is really um, the first time when this happened. Um, the impact of the provisions can be seen from figure one. Next slide. Um, where we show uh, along the horizontal axis, uh, the size of the shock caused by the epi epidemic in terms of um, percentage of changes uh, in GDP from uh, autumn uh, 2019 uh, to spring 21, uh, sorry, to spring 2020. Uh, the vertical axis measures uh, instead the funds provisions in percentage of the country's net national income. Um, for Italy, they should be around 6%, um, whereas the, the size of the shock, next slide please, is, a, is about 10%. You can see Italy uh, along the 10% the um, uh, horizontal axis. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry, we, we can uh, come back to the, the previous slide, please, uh, to show, to have an idea of what happened to, to other, um, uh, to other um, countries. Uh, France uh, had a, also a, a, an important contribution, but only 2%, even if um, uh, it, it um, was hit by, by, a, uh, by a, a shock of 9.5%. Uh, 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 Spain is, Spain uh, was hit by by uh, eleven percent, about eleven percent shock, and had a very high contribution uh, with respect to the the um, uh, its GDP. Next slide, please. Well, uh, I'm sorry that there were some technical problems with Nicola's paper, but it was really appealing and stimulating. Uh, I think the slide have circulated among us, so you can see them. Uh, there was, a, as you have seen, an initial part uh, about theory and institutional aspects. But I will focus, because of time limitations, on the empirical part concerning the past, the present, and the future. 
relative to the past, uh, the focus of the paper was on the asymmetries, for example, higher inflation rates in the periphery and the current accounting balances that were so crucial before and during the financial crisis. I agree with this point, but I observe that in the last decade, the situation a little bit changed. For example, you know, in Italy, we had the current account surpluses since 2013. And in the last decade, the inflation rate has been lower than the European average. So the real problem concerning Italy and other countries is the low growth rate due to the lack of investment, to the lack of aggregate demand, and especially internal demand, because exports are not so bad. So it is not really a problem of competitivity. It is a problem of internal demand, public expenditure and investment and so on. And as you know, the problem, a big problem of stagnant productivity. Uh, concerning the present, uh, after the striking impact of the pandemic, and we have seen it uh, in the last uh, graph uh, shown by Nicola, uh, the response of the European Union has been different, very different from the previous ones uh, to what, uh, what is written in the paper. Thanks to this uh, response, uh, in 2021, this year, the uh, recovery will be robust and uh, the current uh, forecasts are uh, for a rate of growth of about 5% this year. Uh, concerning next uh, years, uh, in the paper, uh, Nicola uh, reports the estimates of Codonio. But uh, I will quote here the official uh, figures uh, published in the Programma Nazionale di Riforma e Resilienza. According to which, additional growth rate will be about 3.6% cumulated at the end of the period. But uh, the, the doubts concern potential growth rate because according to the official document, the annual potential growth will be increased by 0.8% each year. And this comes from additional 0.5 coming from the investments and additional 0.3 coming from the structural reforms. Well, there were many doubts as in particular concerning structural reforms. First of all, we don't know if they will be really completed and their impact is really uncertain. Uh, the future, um, the, the final part of the paper by Nicola uh, refers to the possible perspectives in the next year concerning the European Union. The big question here is, is the current change of attitude provisional or durable? Will the new line of conduct uh, be followed by a retreat of a relaunch of the European Union? These are the two uh, questions raised in the final slide by Nicola. Uh, I agree with him that the answer is quite difficult. Uh, and I think in particular, it is too early to imagine an European Hamiltonian moment. Uh, probably uh, it will come some year in, in future. But uh, I think anyway that this European Union we have seen last year, has certainly progressed compared to 10 years ago. Uh, you remember the too little, too late approach, austerity, and so on. Another key element, besides the new fiscal policy, will concern the monetary policy. Uh, and Nicola doesn't talk about it, but I think it is important to see what the European Central Bank will do in the next future. For example, the investments of sovereign bonds will continue how long? Forever, who knows? Uh, in this case, the help by the monetary policy will be quite important. Well, I think that such practical questions are important for the present life of European citizens. I finish here, okay, thanks. Thanks, Enrico. And uh, now I invited uh, Donatella Saccone, University of Pollenzo, and. Uh, Turing Center on Emerging Economies, 
for the last presentation that will be about the public investment multiplier, empirical evidence for European Union, Union countries and policy implications. Please, Donatella. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Marcello, for the introduction. So uh, I know that we are late, so I will try to stay in 10, maximum 15 minutes. And uh, I will start uh, uh, from the rationale of uh, our analysis as uh, we, we moved from the fact that uh, in the extant literature, there are uh, numerous studies on the, um, estimating the multipliers for total public expenditure, but just few studies that try to estimate the public investment multipliers. This is notwithstanding the crucial role that public investment uh, has been proven to have, because uh, the few studies estimating the multipliers for public investment show that uh, actually uh, public investment uh, has uh, higher multipliers with respect to other components of public spending, as well as better capacity to expand output and productivity in the long run. By the way, recently, this uh, crucial role of public investment uh, has also been recognized by international institutions like IMF and the European Commission. And uh, even more recently, by the well-known uh, uh, European investment plans uh, as a response to the pandemic recession. And then uh, the political debate uh, has increasingly focused uh, on the allocation of public resources. Uh, and then uh, the, the research question that has become relevant uh, is uh, which categories of public investment have the highest and most persistent multiplicative effects on GDP. Uh, however, there's no empirical evidence about this fact. And then uh, uh, the contribution of our analysis is uh, estimating multipliers of public investment, which are classified in 10 different functions of gov government, with the final aim of um, informing the discussion about fiscal allocation of public resources. Um, for the empirical analysis, uh, we um, took data from Eurostat, uh, which uh, provides uh, uh, the value of public investment uh, in uh, 10 functions of government, according to the International Standard Classification. And then we collected uh, yearly data for 31 European countries uh, observed uh, over the period 1995-2019. Unfortunately, quarterly data were not available, so the, the period that we observed was quite short. Uh, the 10 uh, functions of government uh, that we took into account uh, are general public services, defense, public order and safety, economic affairs, environmental protection, housing and community amenities, health, recreation, culture and religion, education and social protection. Um, I don't want to bother you with um, too much uh, technical details, also because it's uh, almost lunchtime, but uh, I need to give you some, some information about the methodology that we followed. And uh, in order to estimate the multipliers of public investment, uh, we relied uh, on uh, the local projections method. That is a method originally introduced uh, in 2005 uh, and then largely adopted uh, by the literature on fiscal multipliers uh, because of uh, its uh, advantages if compared to the uh, more traditional uh, structural vector autoregressive models as they avoid dynamic restrictions and complex specifications uh, and as a consequence uh, are less sensitive to misspecification and also easily to es be estimated. Basically the idea is uh, to estimate uh, age regressions, one for each forecast horizon, where the impulse response functions uh, are obtained through projecting the macroeconomic variable of interest, in our case the change in GDP, on past values of the fiscal variable. In our case, as you can see in the equation, the rate of growth of public investment. We started from a very, very baseline model, uh, taking inspiration from the lady and other authors. 
uh, where you can see in the equation the response of GDP uh, at each horizon is modeled uh, as a function of a change uh, in the rate of growth of public total public investment at time t. And then, and this is the novelty of the analysis, uh, we uh, broke down public investment in the 10 class, um, functions of government and basically we estimated the 10 different models, one for each uh, function of government. Um, well, uh, uh, before uh, um, presenting the results, uh, I just want to underline that we discussed uh, uh, about uh, the possibility that reverse causality exists. Indeed, uh, public spending uh, and also its single components uh, as a consequence could be partially determined by the contemporaneous variation of GDP. The literature agrees on the fact that this is uh, unlikely to happen within the same quarter, but we dealt with uh, yearly data, and then it may represent a problem. Previous literature uh, provided uh, some arguments uh, excluding endogeneity of public investment, uh, because as the lady and other authors underlined, uh, um, we must say that uh, in presence of cyclical fluctuation of GDP, usually mon monetary policies are preferred because they are quicker to be implemented and require uh, less uh, uh, shorter institutional bureaucratic and technical decisions. By the way, previous literature also provided some evidence against reverse causality, but we wanted to check that. And then we regressed the early rate of growth of public investment on the contemporaneous GDP growth. And to do that, we instrumented GDP growth uh, by the US weighted economic growth as suggested by Panizza and Jaimovic. I don't have time to, to enter into details, but if you want additional details, I can give uh, them during the discussion. I prefer to uh, move to the results. And uh, here I reported the results from the first set of regressions that we ran. And you can see, first of all, that uh, uh, pub total public investment as a whole has uh, a significant and persistent multiplicative effect on GDP growth. And uh, uh, by the way, the, the values that we found uh, are quite in line with the values estimated by previous works, and this uh, reassures us about uh, the reliability of, uh, of the estimates when we brought down uh, the investment uh, by uh, functions of government. And then here you can also find the estimated multipliers for each of the functions of government that resulted to have a significant effect on GDP. They are economic affairs, education, housing and community amenities, public order and safety, and general public services. The uh, dashed lines represent the 95% confidence interval. Then we try to uh, check if our results are robust to the adoption of different specifications and samples. At first, we put uh, all the 10 categories of public investment jointly in the same regression as they are part of the same um, fiscal package, and then we wanted to study the joint effect and to see if it affects affects the results. Then we added a set of control variables selected on the basis of existent literature. And finally, we used the random resampling to see if results changed with the samples. Uh, what uh, emerged uh, is that uh, uh, the persistent and robust multiplicative effects that we previously found uh, are confirmed uh, just for total public investment uh, uh, as a whole and then for uh, three uh, functions of government, uh, economic affairs, education and general public services. While for the other function, for the investment in the other functions of government, we did not find any significant effect. This does not mean that uh, uh, public investment in the other sectors did not have any effect 
uh, on, uh, in any country, but this means that on average, our data did not capture any regularity in uh, their effect. Uh, finally, we also checked uh, if uh, results uh, changed uh, when different growth regimes uh, are studied, because the previous literature has shown how actually the multiplicative effect of fiscal policy is uh, higher and also more statistically significant uh, under periods of low growth and recession, and then we verify that. Uh, in order to do that, we uh, approximated the two states of the economy, high and low growth, uh, using alternative methods, but especially we exploited the fact that uh, in at the time span that we considered there was the, the Great Recession, and then uh, uh, we used the Great Recession as a breaking point, uh, and we split the, the data set in two different subperiods. 1995 to 7 and then 2008 um, in 2019. And uh, the results that emerged from this, uh, this last set of regression uh, were quite uh, interesting because, uh, first of all, for total public investment as a whole and also for economic affairs, education and general public services, which are the sectors in which public investment resulted to be, uh, to have a significant and persistent effect, it emerges that uh, uh, actually this uh, uh, persistent effect is mainly due to uh, the positive effect on GDP that public investment had during the low growth regime, while during the high growth regime, so in the first uh, sub-period, actually the effect was significant just uh, at, the, at the first horizons. And then another result that uh, emerged from this last set of regression is that uh, uh, also uh, public order in pu public investment in public order and safety and health turn out to have uh, a significant uh, uh, multiplicative effect uh, again uh, under the low growth regime. So this basically uh, confirms the results of previous uh, literature regarding the fact that public investment uh, uh, have higher multipliers uh, under low growth regime, uh, but uh, it uh, uh, put in evidence uh, uh, this fact for specific categories of public investment. So uh, what can we conclude from uh, our analysis? Uh, as, I, as I underlined, uh, when we check for the robustness of the results, uh, total public investment is confirmed to have uh, um, higher multipliers. Uh, we checked also uh, the, um, the value of uh, public multipliers for uh, uh, the, the um, residual public spending, and we found that actually public investment has the highest multipliers. But this is particularly true when public investment uh, uh, is used to support the creation of human capital and the functioning of economic affairs and general public services. Uh, it's worth underlining that the general public services also include basic R&D and the functioning of public institutions. Uh, then, uh, under periods of low growth, uh, the multipliers are confirmed to be larger and significant also when resources are invested in other functions of government uh, and uh, specifically in the promotion of health and of public order and safety. Uh, these uh, findings uh, can, uh, can be important uh, uh, in the debate on the role that public investment can have uh, in uh, accelerating the post-pandemic recovery. Uh, we also discussed uh, some further extension of uh, our analysis, uh, as uh, in the analysis we mainly treated public investment, uh, the different categories of public investment uh, as uh, separate, uh, while actually public investments uh, are part of the same package of fiscal policy, and then it could be interesting also to study how they interact, uh, and especially if there are uh, 
trade-offs and synergies uh, across the different uh, categories of public investment. Finally, there's a point that I want to underline because uh, it's, um, it's uh, important uh, in my opinion, and it is that uh, the fact that we did not find any significant and persistent multiplicative effect for public investment in environmental and social protection does not mean at all, of course, that governments should not invest there. Why? Simply because they are considered crucial sectors for fostering sustainable development, as also uh, underlined by the European Commission in the context of the next generation EU guidelines uh, with the principle do no significant harm. And this means uh, that uh, um, this consideration calls for new investigation on the effects that different categories of investment not only have on strictly economic uh, variables, but uh, also on uh, social and the environmental targets uh, that are mentioned uh, in the Agenda 2030. So I think I concluded. So Marcello, so I Bella. took time, uh, 15 minutes. Perfect. <laughs> So thank you for the attention and I'm fully available. We for use all the time. So I just conclude by thanking all the presenters and discussants. But I like to summarize the four presentations in a very simple sentence. That is the following. History, institution, economics, and last but not least, politics are all crucial for better understanding a complex dynamic reality and also to suggest possible economic policies for a better uh, Europe for the uh, next generation. In, my, in our view, to have a stronger Europe is also uh, an instrument to have uh, a better uh, global dimension, not only a better Italy, a better Europe. Also the cultural and political aspects are crucial in the uh, global uh, scenario. Thank you very much to everybody. In 15 minutes, the Villa Mondragone International Economic Seminar will continue. I, I don't know if uh, uh, Professor Paganetto want to add something. Thank uh, you again want... for the, the very interesting uh, uh, session. And uh, let me say that uh, uh, I, I have um, a bit of experience on the topic that we discussed. And, uh, I learned a lot, so this is a, the, is a proof that the, uh, for me, a proof for me that the session has been very interesting. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, I, 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 I am very happy to have the opportunity to talk uh, with you, with Anna Maria Simonazzi, with uh, Donato Masciandano, Pompeo della Porta, uh, della Posta, Enrico Marelli, Donatella Saccone. Uh, thank you again and uh, would be in touch for the, I mean, uh, uh, 